Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Cassandra Chow. I am a second year nephrology fellow. And today we will be talking about water and salt handling on a deserted island. The inspiration for this talk comes from a particular discussion that I had with a scientist at the Origins of Renal Physiology Conference earlier this year, when we were discussing the journey of discovering various hormones that are involved in water and salt handling. So my hope for today is that we together can appreciate this process of discovery and hopefully learn a thing or two along the way about a sometimes confusing topic in nephrology. So to set the scene for our story here, let's say that we have three passengers on this tiny plane, a plane that's quite similar to the one that Mahala and I took to get to the origins of renal physiology conference. And these three passengers are having a, a great flight up until, uh-oh, they hit a big storm and the plane goes down. Fortunately though, all three people survive they end up on this island, each of them in a separate microenvironment, and each one of them is going to help us learn something about water and salt handling. So this will be our outline for today. I'm going to go through the water and salt experiments uh, pretty quickly, and then we will spend the majority of the time talking about the water immersion experiments. All right, so our first survivor finds his way to the island and he happens upon a fresh pool of water. And he is going to help us to think about what happens when we take in a water load. Now, I realize that what happens when we take in a water load is super obvious. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that what's obvious now wasn't always obvious before. So J.G. Priestley was this research fellow back in the early 1920s and he wrote this particular article. And some previous discoveries that he made included the more water you drink, the more urine you make, and the fact that water appears to distribute into various compartments. Now again, at this point, this is all common knowledge, but I just wanna take a moment to appreciate the fact that this wasn't always common knowledge. And back in the day, people really had to observe their surroundings, observe what was happening to them and ask, why? So I think it's pretty incredible, you know, what people were able to figure out with just some curiosity and some creativity. But anyway, so J.G. Priestley had a number of people take in this two liter water load. And he saw that when these people were already hydrated, their urine output really shot up in the, the first hour or so. And then it kind of uh, tapered down. And the question of the early 1920s was, you know, what is causing this pattern? And the prevailing theory at that time was that it was this osmotic pressure that's doing this. But even a couple of years later, into 1927, people were still trying to figure out what these mechanisms were, what these factors were that were stimulating the kidneys to action. Of course, now we know there are three main hormonal factors. And to elucidate this first hormonal factor, let's say that this monkey drops a coconut on this poor guy's head. It's having a terrible day, and he develops diabetes insipidus. So in this paper in 1927, they were actually studying this 17-year-old boy who had been in an automobile accident and developed diabetes insipidus. You know, he was peeing like five to 10 liters of urine a day. And prior to this time, it had been sort of known that the pituitary gland had some kind of like antidiuretic property to it. So they thought to themselves, hey, what if we um, infuse pituitary solution into this boy who's peeing 10 liters of water a day? Let's just see what happens. So as you can see here in this timeline, the pituitary solution was given at the orange mark. And as time goes on, you see that the urine output eventually drops to zero and the urine concentration increases as well. So with studies like this, they not only help to elucidate the uh, mechanism of action of, or then the mechanism of diabetes insipidus, but also the fact that the pituitary does have um, a strongly antidiuretic property in at least a part of the gland. Um, and of course, now we know of this as the antidiuretic hormone or ADH. 
So we are very familiar with ADH and um, how it helps with water handling in the kidneys, but how are salt and water handling connected? So this brings us to our second survivor. So this guy also happens upon some fresh drinking water, lucky for him, for now. <laughs> and the main question we're asking ourselves now is, does salt excretion increase with water load? Now the following study here also comes from J.G. Priestley, and it's a little bit of a busy diagram here, so let me walk you through this. So the main thing that he was looking at was what happens with chloride excretion per hour versus urine excretion per hour after a water load. So the left side of this diagram here is looking at the control where this group of people had breakfast at 8 a.m., but then nothing to eat and drink for the rest of the day. And then the right side then is the experimental group or the water load group. So let's go through this bit by bit. So one of the first things that they looked at was actually the blood chloride concentration. So as you can see in the control group, the blood chloride concentration does not change over time. But after the two liter water load, the blood chloride concentration appears to go down and then it starts to come back up back to baseline. So the question they were asking here is, is this happening because more chloride is being excreted in the urine? So this bottom part helps us to answer that. So as you can see here, after the two liter water load, we see that the urine output really increases quite a bit as we would expect. But when you look at the curve of the chloride excre excretion per hour, this doesn't really change at all. This does not match the urine excretion rate. And in fact, it looks really similar to this control group back here. So then when we're looking back up here, then this is telling us that the chloride concentration probably went down because of an initial dilution, and then the water eventually moved into different compartments. So if you need some more evidence, um, J.G. Priestley did this other study here where he essentially gave people this sort of tea toast diet for three days, where you can see that at each of these little arrows, the participants received 100 cc's of water and two biscuits. And then into the third day, <clears throat> they received this two liter water load. So the participants were essentially chloride depleted up until this point. And then when they were given this water load, we see that the urine excretion increases really significantly, but the chloride excretion does not change. So this led them to think there has to be something different that's controlling the water that's going in the urine and the salt that's going in the urine. So we know that ADH is controlling how much water is going in the urine. So what's controlling the salt that's going in the urine? Well, now we know that it's aldosterone. It took them a couple of decades to, to get there, but they finally discovered it in the 1950s. <clears throat> so let's apply what we know about aldosterone now. So let's say that the monkey brings along his friends and a bunch of monkeys now chase this guy into the ocean. And with the, the stress of it all, he now has decompensated heart failure from Takatsubas. So now that he's in the ocean, what would ocean water do to his heart failure exacerbation? Especially that ocean water is 3.5% saline. So also back in the 1920s, people were wondering what happens when you take in hypertonic saline? Is it going to prevent diuresis? Because would salt hold water into the body? Of course, this is not what they found at all. So when they gave people a salt load, 30 grams of sodium chloride and 300 cc's of water, you can see here that, of course, the rate of um, urine chloride excretion rose, but the rate of water excretion rose as well. And then the effect was quite prolonged even after nine hours of the salt load, we're still diuresing. And this line up here is just showing the blood chloride concentration. So I just wanna take a moment to apply this and talk a bit about using hypertonic saline in augmenting diuresis. So as we all know, this is the most helpful in patients who have low chloride. And that's because hypochloremia promotes salt retention and kind of prevents diuretic efficacy by increasing renin secretion and increasing the upregulation of sodium chloride channels in the DCT. 
So this diagram I took from the 2016 article, Hypokaremia and Diuretic Resistance in Heart Failure. And as you can see here, this diagram is showing us the odds for low diuretic efficiency. So higher part of the curve is bad, lower part of the curve is better. So as you can see here, with low chloride levels, particularly below chloride of 96, hypochloremia is associated with a poor diuretic response. But when you follow this line to its lowest level, this matches up with a normal chloride around 100. So diuretics appear to be most effective when chloride is normal. So therefore, hypertonic saline is useful in augmenting diuresis by increasing chloride levels and thereby decreasing renin secretion, decreasing that upregulation of the sodium chloride channels in the DCT, and temporarily increasing intravascular volume and thereby reducing sodium retention mechanisms that come after. All right, so we, we think a lot about ADH and aldosterone, but what is this third factor that we're missing here? So this leads us to our water immersion experiments. Okay, so the monkeys are chasing this guy too, and they trap him in a pool of water. What? <laughs> So I think water immersion um, might be a new concept for some of us, but before I get more into exactly what that is <clears throat> and why water immersion was used, let me talk a little bit more about Epstein-Murray. So Epstein-Murray is a nephrologist who in, 19, in the 1970s uh, did um, a number of experiments using water immersion. And the cool thing is that when I was at the Origins of Renal Physiology Conference, I actually worked in Murray Epstein's like original lab. Um, and it was actually in that lab building that I had the exact conversation that inspired this whole talk. Um, so that's pretty cool. And also um, this scene here is just behind the lab. It's a really stunning place. But anyway, so what happens with water immersion? So water immersion is really a surrogate for intravascular volume expansion. And what happens here is that hydrostatic pressure causes blood from the vessels of the lower extremities to be forced back to the heart. So therefore, this leads to an increase in central blood volume, CBP, cardiac output, stroke volume, cardiac index, and heart volume. Now, you may ask, does the water really have to go to the neck? <laughs> and you know, Murray Epstein studied this as well, and the answer is yes. And that's because the pressure that's exerted on the body surfaces increases quite a bit for each foot of depth of water. So to have the kind of maximal effect from water immersion, you need the water to go as high as safely possible, which is essentially the neck. So in Murray Epstein's experiments, he did see that with immersion, you have quite a bit of an increase in the heart volume and increase in the intrathoracic volume as well. And this is in contrast to recumbency or, or lying flat. Now, the even more interesting thing that he noticed is that in immersion, there is a really significant increase in the urine sodium excretion rate or naturesis. And that's in comparison to um, seated control and recumbency over here. Now, why is that? <clears throat> Again, at this point, they already knew about ADH and aldosterone. So, you know, the first question they asked was, is this happening because of ADH suppression? So they looked at ADH in immersion, and they had two groups of immersed participants. The first group in this hydrated state, where their water intake was 3.1% of their body weight per day, and then what they called a hydropenic state, <clears throat> where they took in 1.7% their body weight per day. And what they saw was in the hydrated state, you know, they were thinking, of course, that their ADH is off. And when they put these people then in the water, they saw a really significant diuresis that they attributed to increase in free water clearance. Now in the hydropenic state, of course, they were thinking that they have their ADH on, but when they put them into the water, they still had an increase in diuresis but this increase in diuresis was attributed to increase in osmolar clearance and more from the, the salt excretion. Now they did this other experiment where they were looking at 
hydrated patients who are immersed in water and they infuse them with vasopressin or ADH. And after this infusion, they saw that the diuresis decreased, but they did not see a change in the naturesis. So with this, <clears throat> they were able to say that, well, water immersion does seem to turn off ADH, but this does not explain the naturesis. So is this explained by aldosterone suppression? So Murray Epstein looked at what happens with um, you know, aldosterone and immersion, and he put these participants on a balanced diet in terms of sodium and potassium, and there were four groups. There was a control group, immersion group, and these groups received this exogenous steroid that's sort of like an aldosterone mimic, so I'll just call it DOCA. So there was a DOCA group, and then there was an immersion plus DOCA group. So to compare what happens between some of these groups, when you compare the control plus the control plus DOCA, we see that DOCA, or this aldosterone mimic, decreases sodium excretion and increases potassium excretion, which is definitely what we would expect with aldosterone. Then when we compare the control to the immersion, we see that immersion increases sodium excretion and it also increases potassium excretion. Hmm. Now, we, we, when we compare control plus DOCA and immersion plus DOCA, we see that even in the setting of DOCA, immersion increases sodium excretion and increases potassium excretion. And then finally, when we compare immersion to immersion plus DOCA, DOCA decreases sodium excretion and increases potassium excretion compared to immersion alone. So putting all this together, it looks like water immersion does turn off aldosterone, which totally makes sense in the setting of volume expansion. But this really doesn't fully explain the naturesis, and let me tell you why. So they continued on with this experiment <clears throat> by also looking at the participants when they were in the recovery phase, when they were taken out of the water. Looking at the rate of sodium excretion here, we do see a decrease in the sodium excretion rate in the recovery phase, but the rate continues to exceed pre-immersion values and control values. And this is in comparison to looking at the rate of urine flow and the rate of free water clearance, where when they were in the recovery phase, they had a more marked decrease in each of these rates. Now, what we would expect up here at the rate of sodium excretion in the recovery phase is we would expect that this line would be kind of more steeply going down. And that's because immersion, of course, as we know now, leads to naturesis and diuresis, which leads to volume contraction, which we would expect that over time should actually be increasing aldosterone. And certainly after you're taken out of the water, your aldosterone should definitely be active. So you should be excreting less sodium in your urine, which is why we expect the curve to look like this. But that is not what we're seeing. We're seeing a delay in the slowing of naturesis. So this led them to think, is there another humoral factor here? Is there another hormone that's like sticking around that's causing this delay in naturesis? So Murray Epstein was trying to put all of this together and he kind of knew about all these other mechanisms that happen <clears throat> with water immersion. As you can see here, we know that water immersion will kind of like turn down this RAS system. Again, he was wondering, is there some kind of other humoral factor that's acting over here that's also increasing our, our urinary sodium excretion? So just a couple of years later, ANP was discovered, atrial natriuretic peptide, and that is our factor number three. So we know now that ANP increases GFR, by causing vasodilation of the afferent arterial and vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial. It causes a decrease in sodium and water reabsorption and also causes a decrease in the secretion of renin and therefore decrease in the production of aldosterone. Okay, so just to apply this to a little more of a real world setting because we don't get like immersed in water <laughs> very often at all. Um, <clears throat> so does positioning affect diuresis and naturesis? And the answer is yes. So this brings me back to this graph over here. Um, when you're lying supine, you are also increasing your preload. 
and you are increasing the amount of blood that's going into the heart, causing that atrial stretch. So your ANP is on, and therefore your aldosterone is turned off. So indeed, you do see an increase in naturesis and diuresis when you're a supine compared to when you're upright, but the effect is not as much as if you were immersed in water. Okay, so this brings me to our final scenario here, kind of putting some things together. What if our person was a dialysis patient? He's getting chased by monkeys too, and then he gets immersed in water. So Murray Epstein did this interesting study looking at anephric patients, patients who did not have kidneys, um, and seeing what would happen to their aldosterone levels when they were immersed in water. And here is a table of the characteristics of all of the 12 patients here. And I just want to point out that the reason for nephrectomy in 10 of the 12 uh, participants here was hypertension, which, which is uh, interesting. <laughs> um, anyway, so looking at the results here, um, this bottom curve is looking at normal patients. So let's start here first. So when these participants are immersed in water, as we expect, the aldosterone um, concentration goes down with immersion because immersion causes a sort of volume expansion. So this is going down. And then when they're taken out of immersion, then the aldosterone starts to go up. However, when we're looking at these people who don't have kidneys, when they're immersed in water, there is no change in, all, in their aldosterone. And of course, no change when they're taken out of the water. Now, why is that? So that is because people who don't have kidneys don't have a functioning renin angiotensin system. So there's nothing that's you know, controlling the up or down regulation of aldosterone in the setting of changes in volume. So basically, this study is showing us that the renin angiotensin system is the main mediator of volume-induced changes in aldosterone. Okay, so we have made it through all of our survivors here. And just to uh, do a quick summary here, um, so number one, I'm hoping that uh, we can appreciate this process of discovery and not take for granted the, the things that we know now. Um, number two, all ADH controls water excretion, aldosterone controls salt excretion, um, hypertonic saline can augment diuresis, water immersion is a surrogate for intravascular volume expansion, and it aided in the discovery of ANP. ANP leads to naturesis and diuresis in the setting of intravascular volume expansion, and water immersion in anephric patients um, showed us that um, the renin angiotensin system is the main mediator of volume induced changes in aldosterone. So, <clears throat> thank you so much uh, to everyone for following along this story. Um, I want to give a big thank you to my mentor, Kate Butler, um, and also big thank yous to Dr. Yoshio Hall and Sarah Sangavi. Um, all of them helped me greatly to refine this presentation. Um, big thank you to my husband, Dr. Matthew Stample, who suggested the use of monkeys, who, um, uh, you know, of course, ended up being fundamental in carrying <clears throat> this story forward. And finally, a big thank you to the Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratories and the Origins of Renal Physiology, um, which was the initial inspiration for this talk. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Cassandra. That was a just a truly wonderfully uh, done job covering a, a very broad topic and and uh, really impressed. Also, a very beautiful slide set. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I also had the opportunity to attend the Origins of Renal Physiology uh, conference or course when I was a fellow, and it's uh, I'm really glad you had the chance to attend also. It's very well done. Um, with that, I, we have time for a few questions. I thought I saw uh, Kate raised her hand earlier. Kate, did you have a question or a comment? I was I was clapping, but oh, sorry. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Very well done. Uh, I have a quick see. question. Um, so uh, I'm happy that you talked a little bit about ANP. I feel like it's like the forgotten hormone in in nephrology. So um, through your like kind of review of of natriuretic peptide, did you happen to come across like the mechanism of action, like how it increases natriuresis? Is it via like 
kind of a pressure necrosis with uh, the elevated GFR, or is it actually inhibiting re reabsorption of, of solute? Yeah, so it's actually both of them. It's it's the increasing of the GFR, and it does that by vasodilating vasodilating the afferent arterial and vasoconstricting the efferent arterial. Um, and also, it does turn down the RAS system, so you do have less aldosterone as well. Very good. Um... Just looking at the chat, seeing if there are any, any questions here in the chat. Looks like lots of, you know, uh, strong praise for you. Cassandra really did a great job in that regard. Um, any other questions or comments for anyone? I, I don't have a question, but I love what I'm reading in the chat. Um, yes. Bessie, can you tell us about this immersion tub at the VA? <laughs> if you have a mic. Um, I, I think it's still there. We would walk veterans uh, like on four East, there was this huge tub and they would go in, um, with their Foley and it would get filled up with water and we would put them in if they were in, you know, a powder renal or just heart failure and we couldn't do anything else. So wow. I think it's still there. Wow. That's awesome. I didn't know about that. <laughs> All right. Thank you well, for a wonderful talk. Yeah, I, I, I agreed. I concur. Really, really great job there, Cassandra.